Hey, welcome to this video in which we're going to talk about form validation in React. So your first question might be, why should you actually validate forms in React? And there are multiple reasons, but one of the major reasons is that you want to validate whether the user entered an email address or, you know, like an invalid email address, or maybe is entered a string or um, a number, I don't know. And that's of course data you don't want to receive because you want to receive just a normal email address. And another reason could be because of security. So this is more a backend related topic, but if you would not validate the form data on both the front and backend, that would mean that you are vulnerable to so-called SQL injections. The thing is, however, that you do not want to use React to validate for these kind of purposes, right? So let's imagine like in a, like a typical application, we have our clients or so our React application and we have our server. So the client then sends every now and then API responses to the server. The server um, processes those requests and then responds with some data, which is then again used in the client. Now, if you only have validation in place in your React application, you can actually not trust it because your React app, you know, the code is essentially shipped, is sent to the user that's using your application. And you, you know, for the average user, they probably have a very difficult time changing the code. And you, there's also ways to make it more difficult also for like, well, people that want to do any harm, but you cannot fully trust that no one is going to alter your code. So someone could simply remove the validation in your React application and then that person is able to bypass your React validation. And that's the reason why you always want to have your validation done on the server, right? There are no exceptions to that. Now that doesn't mean that you should not validate in your React app, but the goal is different right there. The goal there is to provide a better user experience. And generally speaking, you have three approaches. You can validate before you make the API call, so that's, you know, there the client is completely in charge of the validation. You can validate after the API call. So that's actually the server that will then validate the form data and will send back, um, for example, this with error messages. And you can also do both. So let's take a look at that first approach. So right here, like I said before, the client is fully in charge of the validation, right? So that will mean that as soon as there are any errors in uh, the form in the validation, then your React application will essentially not um, make an API call to the server. And of course, like I said, someone could change your code and could bypass the validation. So that's why you always want to make sure that you have validation on your backend as well. But this uh, creates a good user experience because it actually prevents the client to having to send like an API call to the server, wait for the response and then show the error messages. So it's faster and it's more like a, well, you could say client based approach. Now in the second approach, you let the server be fully in charge of the validation. So that will mean, will mean that the client is going to send a request to the server. The server is going to run through the validation and maybe it encounter some errors and then it's going to send them back to the client. So then, you know, with the response you're receiving in your React app, you can show, for example, the error messages. Now I recommend you to do both. And the reason is, is that if you do your validation in your React app, like I said before, you have a good user experience because it's faster and you don't make like an unnecessary call to the server. But on the other hand, you should also um, catch any errors that come back from the server because in like optimal scenario, you will have the same validation rules being applied to your client and to your server. Now, the problem is, is that as you know, the project grows, there could be like a desync in the validation rules. Of course, that's a bad thing in and of itself, but it could happen. So what could happen then if you would, um, well, for example, only rely on the uh, client validation is that the client is going to uh, make the request to the server and then the server will actually find some errors in the form but on your client it will say everything went um you know successful or the, the form was submitted or something like that 
uh, well, actually the validation went wrong. So that's why I always want to make sure that you have your validation on the client, but also catch any errors that come back from the server. Now, there are essentially three ways to validate your forms in React, and that can be done through either HTML, JavaScript or TypeScript, and external libraries. And in this video, I will only get into the first um, two methods because external libraries, there's, for example, React Hook Form, which is a library that's fully focused on making it easy for you as a developer to create forms. And it also has all well, documentation about how you can do validation. Um, there's also libraries like Validator uh, JS, which are fully focused on just the validation part. But since there are so many libraries out there, you know, you can just write, um, read their documentation and it should be fine. But most of the time you will perfectly get away with just HTML or JavaScript or TypeScript um, to validate your forms. So in HTML, you can use attributes to validate form inputs. So the first one are type attributes. And right here, you can see a small snippet. So we have right here, we have an input with a type email. And that will already apply some default validation, which is supported by uh, your browser. And you probably have seen this before. So if you have an input like an email field and you pass a wrong email address, then the browser will actually show you that, um, well, how you can actually uh, make sure that it's a correct email address because you probably made the typo or something like that. And the same goes for number. So if you uh, would set this to a number field, then you're actually, the browser does not allow you to enter a string. And there's many more other type attributes, but um, you know, to keep it simple, email and number are ones you will often use. So in HTML, you also have some other attributes. So again, this is like you have many other um, attributes that you can use, but these are the ones you will probably use the most. <clears throat> so the first one required, um, pretty obvious. You just have to pass required in the um, input element. And uh, what's great is that it will actually show like the same kind of error, right? So right here, it will then say, um, like, please fill in this field, uh, or like, this is a required field, I think it will say. And the signing looks a little bit different across browsers. So uh, that might be a concern from a, um, well, you could say UI UX point of view, but I personally think that the, uh, you know, building browser error messages are perfect. And uh, it's very easy to, you know, kind of like leverage the power of, of your browser. So you also have properties like min max. So these are used for number. So you could say that um, it should have like a minimum uh, value of five. You also have min length or max length, which is used for string. So for example, if you have like a name field and you want to say, I don't want the name to be um, exceeding, let's say 20 characters, you can set max length to 20. The next thing is accept. So if you have like a file upload element in your form, you can actually say that you want to accept only images. And then if you click on the um, upload files button, you will actually see that it will only um, grab like uh, GPAC images and, and PNGs um, from your hard disk. And it will, well, essentially not allow to, to upload uh, PDF files, uh, but you can bypass that on the other hand. But again, that's why you always want to make sure you have your validation done on the server because it can be changed on the front end. And the last thing is a pattern. So you can pass a regex. This is a little bit more advanced, but that is also a possibility. Now, the other approach is to simply use JavaScript or TypeScript, and that's simply by using code. So let's say you have a form with a uh, discounted price and a regular price. Now, of course, you don't want that discounted price to be um, equal than or higher than the regular price because it is a discounted price. So what you can do then is you could just use JavaScript or TypeScript to make a rule that um, the, uh, for example, the on submit should uh, function should return before it's actually going to make the API call. And then you can set an error where you let the user know, for example, that the discount price should be lower than the regular price. So let's try to hack a form. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call this hacking, but 
it, it, it shows you how easy it is to um, alter the code and get rid of the validation altogether. So right here we have a form and if I click right now on send, you will see that it says, please fill in the form correctly. And because of the uh, red border, it shows you that, um, well, there's possibly a required field. Now, what I could do, I can open up my DevTools and if we go to elements and I select that input field right here, you'll see indeed that this input has a required attribute passed to it. Now, if I remove this and I will hit send again, you will see that the red border has gone and let's actually do this for a couple of more fields. Let's do this for email and for phone number. So now you will see when I click on send, also those errors are gone. And now I can simply um, send a, submit a form. So I'll just enter some random data. And now when I go to the network tab and I click on send, you see it says an error has occurred. The form has not been sent. And it says internal ser server error. So right here, they made sure that they also did some validation on the uh, server and let the client know that something went wrong, right? So right here, you can see that we had a server error and the form that we sent was indeed, it was without the email address, it was without the phone number. Now, the problem is if I will refresh the page and I will just remove the uh, the company or actually not send the company field. So I will remove the required attribute. I'll just fill in some random data right here. And now you will see that we are actually able to send this form. So we'll click on send. And you can see we get the um, success message. And when I go all the way up right here, you will see we got a 200 OK back from the server. So that is kind of like already saying that this request succeeded. And you can see when I scroll down that we actually didn't pass a company field with this form. So it's really easy to alter forms by simply going into the elements tab or and, and remove attributes essentially. And you can also remove the JavaScript or, or TypeScript code if, uh, if they also did some validation with that, for example. So I think that the main takeaway from this video should be that you should do validation both on the client and server, and you can perfectly find do your validation with a combination of HTML and JavaScript, right? If you're, um, it, it depends of course on how you should validate. Most of the time HTML is enough, but sometimes when you have like these conditional kind of um, uh, logic, then you gotta use JavaScript or TypeScript. Now, last thing I'd like to say is that you should keep in mind good user experience, right? So it's, well, amongst especially UI UX designers, it's a common thought that you should disable the submit button until the form data is valid. But you will see that a lot of big companies and, you know, this is, let's say, Facebook, Google, uh, Spotify, you see a lot of big companies doing this where they actually, you can see right here, the button is, you know, it seems as if we um, can submit the form right now, right? It also has the, the cursor pointer. And when I click right here, of course, we'll get an error message, but it is possible. Now with message bird, you can see right here. And I think I have to go down to contact. Let's see, contact sales, or actually let's write a uh, sign up. Sign up with email. So right here, you can see that the create an account button is disabled because the form is not validate or is actually, you know, we did not enter the, the correct details and you will probably see as soon as I change this and, and they, for some reason, ah, there we go. So now you can see that when we click on, and um, I agree to the uh, terms of privacy statement, the form becomes enabled. So that's a, you know, good thing from a, a UI UX point of view. On the other hand, um, you know, code wise, this will will actually need you to also validate your form with JavaScript and TypeScript, like essentially every field. So you gotta, um, you gotta keep that in mind. Um, 
it is also important to display error messages properly. So your error messages should be clear. So it should be easy for um, users to understand what actually went wrong and how they can change it um, in order for it to be right. And the location of the error messages, um, you know, most people will say that the error message just below the input field itself is the best approach because they don't have to move their eyes a lot. They can, you know, easily switch from the error messages to the input without, you know, having to try to find the um, uh, input field again. If you, for example, would just have your error messages like somewhere on top or on the bottom. And also keep in mind accessibility. So if you just, for example, make a red border for a required field, some people are colorblind, so they will not really notice that, um, you know, that's actually the field that contains the error. So something like this, you know, where you have, you have your red border, you have your, like your extra section with your error message and you have like a small icon that is accessible for most people that have um, disabilities. So keep that in mind as well. So that was pretty much it for this video. If you liked it, please consider subscribing or giving it a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, let me know down in the comments. Thanks for watching again, and I'll see you in the next one.